All right, good morning. Uh, my topic today is the other birds. And what I mean by that is I am not talking about Alfred Hitchcock and Tippi Hedren and those birds, OK? Um, uh, but first, uh, I'll share a story that I, it has many variations. I'm sure you've heard one of them at least. There was a young couple that got married. And the wife was trying to remember all the things her mother had taught her to do. And so she was making the wonderful Sunday dinner. And uh, as her mother had taught her, she got a ham. And she cut both ends off the ham and put it in a pan and put it in the oven. And uh, her husband watched this a number of Sundays and asked, What's, why do you cut the ends off the ham? I just don't understand. And she says, well, that's what my mother taught me to do. And so they went and asked mom. You know, why do we cut the ends off the ham? She said, you know, I don't know. That's what my mother taught me to do. So they go to grandma. They say, grandma, we've got a question. We've got to ask you, why do you cut the ends off the ham before you cook the ham? And she says, oh, dear, when grandpa and I got married, we were very poor. In fact, we were so poor, I had only one pan, that black frying pan that everybody has. And the ham was always too big for the pan. So we cut the ends off the ham to fit it in the pan. That's why. Um, now, I think. Our pan is the life, the size of the life that we know. You know, that life gives us a big ham. And I don't mean me, OK? <laughs> life gives us a big ham, uh, a big vision, a big idea. And we say, oh, that doesn't fit into my pan. You know, that doesn't fit into the self-concept I have. You know, we could say that we have uh, what Ernest Holmes calls in the textbook a mental equivalent for the life we have. You know, it's what we deeply believe we can have, and it's what we deeply believe we deserve, and it's what we deeply believe is available to us. So what we believe we can have, what we believe we deserve, and what we believe is available to us. Now, Ernest Holmes says this elsewhere also. He says that every soul comes into life, everyone comes to Earth, Everyone has a gift to give, a lesson to learn, and a debt to pay. I think that's so interesting, because that kind of covers all of it, doesn't it? You know, um, that I think uh, all we experience uh, you know, is um, to remember and reawaken the memory of that contract within us uh, and to prepare us to fulfill it. Right? So it seems to me that uh, divine ideas, Hunches, inklings, ahas, revelations, whatever we might call them, come, and they're unfamiliar to us. And what happens is we push them away. We say, nope, not here, not now. This is not for me. But in the science of mind teaching, we teach that we live in God, and God lives uniquely by means of each and every one of us. God expresses through each and every one of us. So everybody has a purpose, but I think our perspective is sometimes off. Sometimes our perspective is way off, even way, way off, if you know what I mean. Because some people will go so far as to say, you know, I wish I'd never been born. I'm shocked when I've heard people say that. Usually, now, I admit that when people say that, they are having a DQM, a drama queen moment, OK? <laughs> And so you just have to know that, that in most cases, they probably don't mean that. You know, but you have been born. It is for a purpose, and your perspective needs help, perhaps even a real attitude adjustment. You know, we don't realize all the lives that we touch. Think of It's a Wonderful Life, which everybody saw too many times over Christmas, right? It's a Wonderful Life was on constantly, and the part that I always remember of that is, yep, that's right, you don't realize the lives you touch, the situations that you contribute to, all of the things that would have been different if you, in fact, had not actually been born. Um, Carolyn Mace said this, uh, you know Carolyn Mace, the archetypes lady, she said, you know that you are on the right path when you are not put in a position to betray yourself. Wow, I think that's really interesting. When we're really true to, to what's in our heart, because you don't have to negotiate your sense of integrity, which is an act of betrayal. You know, when we are a little less than our most integrous self, we're actually betraying ourselves. You know, you know, you know we want to be in a place and approach our life like we feel like I don't have to compromise who I am. You know? Um, compromise, I think, is when you willingly enter in 
Uh, but it's not betraying yourself because you said, I will, I'm consciously choosing this, to participate in this. You know, because it, it, it seems to me, and this is what I believe science of mind teaches us again and again, is that every choice we make either enhances or betrays our spirit. Every choice makes us more. Every choice moves us further on our path or every choice holds us back and keeps us small and limited. So I think that, I think you can't be on the wrong path. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you can't. You cannot miss your destiny, right? You're just not maybe managing the path you're on very well. <laughs> you know, you're maybe making choices that are harmful to you or other people, you know, and, and when your, your life path harms you, I think all that means is you have taken a detour and it's time to self-correct. So um, I'd love to take credit for the story I'm going to tell you now. This is where the birds come in. But um, this story has nothing to do with me. Someone, someone gave it to me. They gave it to me a long time ago. I do not know where it came from, but I liked it so much. I thought, I'm going to use this. And so here it is. Um, a man uh, flew across country for work one day. And before landing, uh, the stewardess uh, came over the loudspeaker and announced his name and said, you know, uh, we know you're on board. Would you please identify yourself? He did. They said, when you get off the plane, there will be someone waiting there. They have an emergency message for you at the end of the ramp. Just what everybody wants to hear, right? Just the guy's like, oh, boy, I hope there's an emergency for me when I'm on the plane, right? So um, he, uh, he gets the message, and it's to call the hospital back home right away. He gets the doctor in intensive care. And uh, he and his wife's three-year-old son uh, um, was crushed by the electric garage door. And, uh, and he'd been severely, critically injured. Um, and the doctor said, you really need to come home now. Now, the dad's response after immediately getting on another plane was it was the longest six hours of his life, as we can all imagine. Right? And so the son, um, when he got there to the hospital, the son's all hooked up to things that are beeping and buzzing and blipping and tubes and machines and all that. And, and the wife kept saying, the, um, she kept saying, I just know he's going to be all right. I just know he's going to be all right. Uh, and so the, the dad tried to hold on to the mom's faith. Um, and so they told the parents that this little boy's sternum had been crushed, uh, being under the garage door. And they didn't know how extensive the damage was to his heart. Uh, and there was a lot of concern about brain damage because when the wife found him, he'd already been uh, unconscious for a while, was clinically dead. Uh, she found him. She screamed for help. And miracle of miracles, a neighbor who happened to be a doctor happened to be home and came running over and administered CPR and helped, uh, you know, do what needed to happen. And he was rushed, the little boy was rushed to the hospital. But, you know, he had been unconscious and without oxygen for a while. And everyone was really afraid that there would be permanent damage to his brain. So they spent all night long in the hospital just worried and praying and concerned. Um, and all night and the next day, the little boy remained unconscious. But in the afternoon, he regained consciousness. Um, and he woke up um, uttering uh, the most beautiful words anybody's ever heard, which was, Daddy, hold me. And, um, uh, and the dad said, these little hands reached out for him. Now, the next day, he was pronounced with no neurological damage at all. And the news spread through the hospital because this was just extraordinary considering what this little guy had been through. You know, um, and, and the parents said, you could not imagine our gratitude and how overjoyed we were. And so they brought their little boy home, and they said, we all felt this unique kind of reverence for life, you know, and, and, and love of God that comes when you've had a brush that close to death. So they said that in the days that followed, it was, uh, there was this very special spirit in our home. The older children were closer to their little brother, um, the, the dad said, you know, my wife and I were much closer to each other, and all of us were closer as a family. Uh, and life took on a less stressful pace. Uh, perspectives seemed to be more focused. We felt deeply, deeply blessed as a family. 
Now, exactly one month from the day of the accident, the little boy woke up from his afternoon nap and said, sit down, mommy. I have something I want to tell you. Now, this little guy is only three years old, so he didn't normally speak in big sentences, but he was really excited uh, as they sat together on the bed, and he began to tell this unbelievable story. He says, remember when I got stuck under the garage door? Mommy, yes. Well, it was so heavy, and it hurt so bad. He says, and I, could, I called to you, but you couldn't hear me. And I started to cry, but it hurt so bad, you know? And, that, and what happened then, Mommy, was the birdies came. Mom says, birdies? And she says, yes, these birdies made this whooshing sound, and they flew into the garage, and they took care of me. They did, Mommy says. Yes, one of the birdies came and got you and told you I was stuck under the door. And this sweet, reverent feeling began to fill the room, and as my wife and son relived this, she said, the spirit was so strong and yet lighter than air my wife realized that a three-year-old has no concept of death and spirit, so he was referring to the beings who came to him from beyond and called them birdies because they were up in the air like the birds that fly. Well, what did the birdies look like, she asked. He said, oh, they were so beautiful, Mommy. They were dressed all in white. Well, white and green. Some of them were green and white, but mostly white. Yeah, they were all white. And did they say anything? Yes, yes, they told me the baby would be all right. The baby, my wife asked. The baby under the garage door. And then you came out, Mommy, and opened the garage door, and you ran to the baby, and you told the baby to stay, not to leave. And she, my wife nearly collapsed from hearing this, for she had indeed knelt beside our little boy's body, his chest crushed and unrecognizable. Knowing he was already dead, she looked up around her, and whispered, don't leave us, baby. Stay if you can. And as she heard the words that brought, uh, our son told her that she spoke that day, she realized that the spirit had left his body and was looking down from above. Then what happened, she said. He said, oh, we went on a trip. We went far away. And he seemed to grow agitated, trying to say things that he did not have the vocabulary or the words for. And my wife tried to calm and comfort him. And he struggled with something that was very, very important to them. He said, we flew up into the air. He says, there are so many, mommy. There's lots and lots of birdies. And my wife was stunned. You know, the sweet, comforting spirit enveloped her more soundly, but with an urgency she had never known before. And our boy went on to tell her what the birdies told him, that he had to come back and tell everyone about the birdies. You know, they brought him back to the house, and a big fire truck and an ambulance was there, and they took the baby out on a white bed, and he tried to tell the man that the baby would be okay, but the man didn't hear him. And the birdies told him that he had to go with the ambulance, but they would be near him all the time. And he says, they were so pretty, they were so peaceful, but he didn't want to come back. Then the bright light came, and the light was so bright and so warm, and he loved the bright light so much. And someone was in the bright light and put their arms around him and told, them, told him, I love you very much, but you have to go back. You have to grow up and play baseball and tell everyone about the birdies. You know, the person in the bright light kissed him and waved by. Then a big sound came, whoosh again, and they went into the clouds. And the story went on and on and on for over an hour. And he says, birdies are always with us, but we don't see them because we look with our eyes. And we don't hear them because we listen with our ears, but they are always there. We only see them in here. And he put his hand to his heart. They whisper to us to do the things that are right because they love us so much. I have a plan, Mommy. You have a plan. Daddy has a plan. Everyone has a plan. And we must all live our plan and keep our promises. Birdies help us do that because they love us so much. And so in the weeks that followed, he told the same story again and again, always in the exact same order. 
it amazed us how he could speak beyond his age when he spoke of his birdies. Everywhere he went, he told people, strangers, people in grocery stores, people at the bank, told them all about the birdies. And surprisingly, no one ever looked at him strangely. They always got a softened look and smiled. So needless to say, we have not been the same since that day. He says, and I pray we never will. Now in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah, the voice of God comes and it says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future with great hope. That's God's plan. But is it our plan? You know, I think we're co-creators with God in this life. This is what the science of mind teaches us. We co-create with God. But if our perspective is off and bigger hams start to come our way, we say, no, 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 it doesn't fit in my pan. That ham's not for me. It seems that God plan, God's plan is to prosper us, to give us hope. But we don't let that come in and through us because we narrow the field based on a narrow, narrow perspective. And I think we all need a balanced perspective. I suspect that probably in every house there's at least one balanced perspective. Not always the adults. Isn't that interesting? You know, that sometimes you may have grown up in a house where it was one of the kids who had the balanced perspective. Hmm? Um, I thought this was cute. If you start the day without caffeine and you get along without pills, and you can be cheerful and ignore all your aches and pains, resist complaining and boring people with your troubles, eat the same food every day and be grateful for it, you know, uh, overlook it when those you love take it out on you through no fault of your own, take criticism and blame without resentment, resist treating a rich friend better than a poor friend, face the world without lies or deceit. If you can conquer tension, relax without drugs, be honest, Say what is deep within your heart, and you have no prejudice against religions, races, creeds, politics, then you are as balanced as my dogs, Emmett and Stella. Yes, you are. <laughs> it's true. Um, in um, 1886, there was uh, a woman who was dying of tuberculosis, and her husband had a withered leg from childhood. One, that withered leg was three inches shorter than the other leg. And she went to a lecture and heard something that changed her perspective. She said, I went into this lecture thinking I was a human being and I left knowing that there was something in me that was divine. I was not a human being, I was a child of God, having a human experience. And as a child of God, I do not inherit sickness. I may be experiencing sickness, but it is not my natural inheritance. This was a new thought to me, a new idea for me, and it got a hold of me, and I was forever different. So speed down the road, several years, she was completely healed. And her husband, his leg grew by three inches. And they were Myrtle and Charles Fillmore, the founders of the Unity Movement, the people who bring us the wonderful Daily Word magazine that I know many of you know. Something within us, I believe, knows the perfect picture of our true being. We say it's a divine blueprint or the, uh, this perfection that's held in trust for us. And when we align our perspective with the truth, right, there is that in us that is freed up now to bring into alignment and experience uh, a replication of our most divine self. So if you have been in small, limited, negative, fearful thinking, if you've been having a really narrow perspective, God may be trying to give you a great life. But if your receiving is really small, it can't come to you. Life doesn't happen to us. We teach in the science of mind that it's always happening through us. All that happens in my life is designed for me to awaken to my divine purpose. All that happens in my life is designed for me to remember my divine purpose. 
And if I have that kind of perspective, I will remember, and I hope we all will when we leave here today, that we are spiritual beings and therefore we are inherently creative. That our thought is always creative, creating something. Louise Hay says it like this, now is the point of power. Now is the moment when you change your thinking. Now is the moment when you think something better. Now is the moment when you do something that's life affirming rather than life depleting, right? The only time there is is now, you know? And now is when I choose the thoughts that I'm going to think. And in the now, if I elevate my thought to the level of God's thoughts, then God's power is within that thought, right? So if we practice this way of being, we'll find that nothing is impossible. Because like the scriptures say, with God, all things are possible. Let's pray. So we, thank you. We turn our attention inward for a moment, recognizing that right here where we are, we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. It is the truth about us. And in this awareness of our connection with God, the infinite, I also know we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And I speak the word for each and every one of us that we are open to being a bigger container for God's good to express in our life. That whatever we have experienced thus far, I know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. That God's infinite good is available to all of us, and so we open ourselves heart and mind to be able to receive and accept and believe in a greater experience of life. I accept this is true for each and every one of us here today. I remember on behalf of all of us, that we are spiritual beings having the human experience here and that the spirit that we are is now and always connected to that infinite presence that we know is God. We are a part, we are a parcel of God. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, and we know that right where they are, they are surrounded and filled with God's infinite, loving, intelligent spirit. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So that our prayer, the energy of our thought, the content of our heart goes into every situation that pulls at our attention as peace of mind, as healing, as all needs met, as reconciliation, as peace for everyone involved. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know that we are blessed by being together that everyone gets to be healed, everyone gets to be raised up. And so, with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth right now. And I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.